Austin's voices are so necessary and essential. Assalamualaikum and welcome to NBA Authors Speak. I'm your host, Leila Abdullah Poulos, and the author that has graced me with her presence today is Um Jawaria. Um Jawaria, Miriam A. Sullivan, is a native of Springfield, Massachusetts, and is a second generation American Muslim urban educator, business owner, and storyteller. She is the author of Tried and Tested, love the book. The, the, size of the, mustard, the Size of a Mustard Seed, Hen's Hands, and The Princess and the Good Seed. Um Juari has been nominated for a Pushcart Prize and was a recipient of the Lorraine Hansberry Award from Holyoke Community College and a Spirit Award from the Harold Grinspoon Foundation. Her writing and short stories have been featured in several Muslim and non-Muslim publications around the world. She is the editor-in-chief for, for the New England Muslim Women's Association and the founder of the literary initiative, Muslim Girls Reads, which I totally stand for. And I'm totally like Ron Ron every year that she has the uh, fundraiser and the GoFundMe launch. I'm like, let's give them all the money because it's a really great initiative. Um, Joy holds a bachelor's degree with honors from Bay Pass University, a master's degree with honors from Regis University, and is currently a doctoral candidate. Assalamualaikum, Um, Joy. How are you? Alaikum salam, rahmatullahi wa Thank you so much for joining me. I uh, look at the the breadth of your work, and I think it's very interesting. You you write a lot in a lot of different genres and perspectives. Okay, mm. how long have you been writing? What was that? How long have you been writing? Oh, wow. Um, I would say seriously since fifth grade. Like, that's when I knew it. Like, I want to write. You knew that you wanted to write from that early in age? Yeah. What was uh, it about writing that drew you? Huh? What was it about writing that drew you? Um, well, I was also a reader. I love I love reading. So, um, you know, going to the library, that was my thing on Saturdays. We lived uh, maybe two blocks from downtown, the main library. And, you know, going, I would just get like, you know, my five books that I could check out. I would take them home and I read them all and bring them back the next Saturday. And it really hit me early on that, you know, my, my favorite characters were nothing like me. Mm. Their families were nothing like mine. And it was like, well, you know, let me write a Jamila and see if I could do that. You know, let me write about an Aisha, you know, or a Layla or a Muhammad or Bilal. And so, you know, I would, you know, read the Babysitter's Club and think about what a Jamila would do you know, if a situation, you know, somebody allowed her to watch the kids and, you know, oh, she spilled something or she had a overflow of water in the basement. Like what would a young Muslim girl or a young Muslim boy, how would they handle those everyday situations that we all go through, which is why I, you know, um, had a connection with those books because there were still similar situations, but I just didn't see the representation. Okay, so that's important. You know, uh, one of the things that I always quote, Swar Abdul Khabir, if you don't see yourself, you can't love yourself type of thing. Mm. That's one of the reasons why I wrote in romance because I, in my teenage years, that's when I started uh, reading romance and it was always, no one ever looked like me. The closest that it came to was Beverly Jenkins, an African-American author. And even still, uh, you know, she wrote very specific women that, you know, that mm. uh, aligned with the beauty standards. Of that, that's time. another one. Yeah. So I really wanted to write, uh, romances that were more indicative of how I, uh, of, so that I can see myself and my readers can see themselves, you know, and especially, mm -hmm. you know, uh, black Muslim women, you know, so mm -hmm. that's very important. So I totally understand. And I think that your, uh, you are the premier urban Muslim urban fiction writer, okay, um, that focuses on Muslim characters. Mm. I make that. <laughs> and I think that that's important because urban fiction is such an important genre to African-American culture and Black culture. And uh, 
the 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 African American Muslim culture is a part of that, and so you kind of made you made that transition into bringing in the a, a part of Black culture, which is African American Muslim culture, and really highlighting it in your books, like in Tried and Tested. And I I really think that that's great. So do you exclusively write? uh black characters or are you gonna ever branch out or you like tony morrison like this is where i am i am the mainstream <laughs> type of thing i get that so much that's that's one thing that and it kind of bothers me you know but not enough you know i'm not a mean person or anything like that but i get that a lot from other readers outside of the black latinx community you know well when are you going to you know, change and maybe talk about like a white revert or, and I've had, I do, I'll put in, you know, I'll sprinkle yeah. in yeah. white people in my books, but that's not good enough. They want them front and center. Yeah. <laughs> you see yeah. what I'm saying? And it's like, I, cause I know within our communities, you know, I've, I've had white Muslim friends in high school. You know, we have families, you know, in Indo-Pak and Arabs in our communities, but we are front and center in my world. Yeah. We are. Mm -hmm. We are the majority. You know, when, 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 when I went to school, you know, the girls who wore hijab and, and covered like Muslims were black girls, black Muslim girls. The boys whose parents made them wear kufis to school were black little boys. We bur we we had that burden. You understand? And I'm not putting down anybody else's peers because maybe they did they knew something our peers didn't know. But the ones who got picked on and people try to pull hijabs and we had to get to fighting and and scuffing and calling brothers and aunties and uncle, they looked like me. Yeah. We fought. You know, we had to stand strong to represent Islam. And yet and still people still, you know, jump over us. You know, even though the first Muslim that really anybody gets to see in this country is someone brown or black. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, even today, I don't think most people know a lot of immigrant Muslims. There are still communities where they are not at. They are, and especially because government-wise, they like to place them, you know, in obscure places. Mm -hmm. So you don't really see a lot of, you know, Syrian Muslims in the hood. I think that, you know, um, I've been asked a couple of times about writing uh, female characters, specifically my female characters, because my male characters can change. All mm -hmm. right. I write interracial women. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the male characters, like the, the, my book that's coming out, my next book that's coming out, he is an Irish American convert. The uh, one there's one where I have a, a, a um, Indian American convert. You know, my book, Open to Love, Indian American. My book, uh, Queen of the Castle, is the, the male character is Turkish American. Okay, so, but the consistent thing is that all the women are African American. Right. And I'm Muslim. And my books that feature non-Muslim characters, the it's an African American woman. And my books mm -hmm. that feature Muslim characters, the African American Muslim woman. And that's because we don't see enough of ourselves, and especially in romance, which is saturated with white femininity and um, with white authors. So mm -hmm. I, I don't want to write about any other female character. Right. I right. totally get what you're saying. And I'm so glad that you, I, I am glad that you make that stance. I'm just going to be honest about it because when we look at American Muslim literature in its totality, okay, it is changing a little bit, but it becomes very difficult for me as a parent, I'll go from that perspective, me as a parent to have enough literature so that my kids see themselves. Mm -hmm. you know, they may see Black children. They may see Muslim children, but the combination of the two is comparatively rare. Yeah. Okay. So for an author, for a Black Muslim author to make that stance and say, no, I'm featuring uh, Black people because it's important to me. It is because it's important to the culture itself. 
And right. Especially, we want our kids to see themselves. I want to see myself in the in the fiction that I read as mm -hmm. well. You know, um, I have to read a, an expansive Muslim uh, fiction and nonfiction, but Muslim fiction. And when I read things like Tried and Tested, or when I read books like Her Justice by uh, Nasheed Jackson, mm -hmm. I see my culture, mm -hmm. you know? Sometimes I feel like, um, I don't wanna make any broad generalizations, but I'm not gonna be able to help it at this point. So, sometimes I'm just like, okay, well, I'm kind of tired of seeing, you know, Muslim women portrayed a certain way because that's not my cultural perspective. That's someone else's mm -hmm. cultural perspective. That mm -hmm. is not the cultural perspective of a Muslim woman. And I get kind of tired of that. That's why authors like Um Zakia are refreshing too. It's like, make that stand. And, but she writes other characters. She doesn't write exclusively black characters. But mm -hmm. when she does and she shows that, cult, like, you know, like the, the upwardly mobile black Muslim. <coughs> I think that that's important. I want to see that. Yeah. You know, when in, in tried and tested, you know, the communal aspect of it, when you depict it, like the community and the talks between the women, you know, it was something that I can very much connect with because I've had those talks. Mm -hmm. you know? So I think that that's very important. And I like the fact that um, when you write children's uh, stories, you tell it from that, you tell it from that cultural perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, so just like in the uh, the uh, short story in Black Muslim Reads, you know, Coach uh, Coach Yusuf's Rules, you know, and his like, you know, gung-ho and the way <laughs> it was just like, I read it to my girls and then my daughter, she picked, she picked it up and she reread that one. She reread that story. That's what I always oh, go man. by. If the kid is reading it by themselves, then they like the story, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. They can like it when I read it, but I know they really like it when they pick it up by themselves because mm -hmm. they get to see themselves in those stories. So I'm, I am really glad that you did decide to contribute to and edit it and decide to contribute to Black Muslim Reads. I think that it's an important um, anthology of writing that features Black Muslim authors. And um, like you, you, what made you decide to say yes? Because I was... I, everyone is very, very busy. You're an educator, you're an author, you're, you're a mom. And so I was just so scared that you would not say yes. Hmm. What made um, you decide to say yes? I think that it, it's definitely needed. The diversity to show our strengths and our interests are vast, you know, and we can celebrate all of that. And we can champion each other and um, we can show our diversity. I think that's really, that was really important to me that you didn't, you know, pigeonhole it and say it has to be this particular type of genre or this particular, you really made it broad enough that, you know, there's some poetry, there's some romance, you know, there's some children's fiction. It really was, um, you know, a labor of love to show our strengths and our diversity as black Muslim writers. And so, you know, I'm all for it. I'm all for it because I think it's so needed. You know, it's needed in our schools. It's needed in the universities. Um, it's needed worldwide. When we say that, you know, we are here, we are writing, we are sharing our narratives and that these narratives are, are part of our culture. The storytelling is so um, weaved into the Black American experience, and that we are honoring that culture and that we want to preserve it and pass it down to the next generation of Muslim writers and say that, you know, this is for you. This is our gift to you. Take it and run with it, inshallah, and know that, you know, we support you and that we're there for you. So, you know, the story is really powerful. I think, you know, I, one of the reasons why I wanted to do something, and I didn't make it oh, a specific genre. You know, it's funny because um, I had, with a lot of hesitancy, uh, started working on a project, um, Muslim writers, for, uh, uh, for a publisher. <laughs> and uh, I won't name the publisher. Uh, 
it was interesting because I was one of a team of editors on the book. Just like with Black Muslim Reads, it was like when you do an anthology, you do more than one editor. And so I was one of a team of editors and the stories, it, the stories were expanse, you know, basically one of the reasons why I was born on board was because, well, we don't know any black Muslim writers. Do you know any black Muslim writers? Yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, which is a tragedy, which is just really speak to a tragedy. But uh, I'm like, okay, so that's the reason why I joined the team because I just was like, okay, well, I want to do that. And so there was a breadth of writing from Muslims from across different backgrounds, all right? And I had the feeling that this would happen. I had the feeling that this would happen because while I'm working on this project, I'm still doing Black Muslim Reads the whole time because my whole thing is like, no, we're going to get these voices out there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, type of thing. And so um, it was... It, there was some really, really good writing. Uh, and I mean, there, there, were, there were submissions from Black Muslim writers who are award-winning and who have their works out there, who have a readership, who have a fan base and everything like that. But when it came up for review, okay, they only liked the stories by the, the literary fiction type pieces, mm -hmm. Middle Eastern. No, yeah. that was it. That was that's it. That's what happened that's right now. Eastern. That's all they wanted. And I, not, it's not the, the Middle Eastern writer's fault. No, it's, it's not. It's not. But it was like, that's what they saw. When they thought of Muslim writers, they did not think of uh, the expanse of work that's out there when it comes to writing. I mean, not everybody reads like these. I'm not going to say highbrow because fiction can be very highbrow. Yeah, love it. Literary fiction is fiction. But these literary pieces, you know, uh, with these kind of ethereal, uh, omniscient types of narratives, um, talking about the same thing, basically. And I mean, those, the, those writers were good too, but it was just like from the perspective of a literary critic, it was just like, wait a second, dude, what is wrong with you? Like, for real, do you not see this work, this compendium of work that these, uh, of these black writers that stuff is incredible. You have urban fiction, you have literary pieces, you have uh, uh, more reflective pieces. Like, are you kidding me? Like, for real, yeah. dude. For real. <laughs> That's why I was so glad that I kept going because I was going to stop because it's a lot of work to do both. And I was going to stop a whole Black and Muslim read them and, and publish it in 2021. Mm. Then someone was just like, no, we got to get these voices out there. And I just was like, and so that, that project is right now just stagnant. That's mm. the, only, the only reason why I like independent publishing. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Control how much, uh, what, the timeline, you know, yeah. just to throw it out of whack, it's still my timeline. Right. And I get to control that timeline. So it's just like, so now those voices are stuck. Whether or not they'll ever be published, I don't know. But Black Muslim Reads is out. And yeah. Most useless rules is out. Is out. And so it's like a great thing. I mean, there's, it, there's like, a, and like you said, there's an expanse of work in it. And now people get to read it. And it's gotten a lot of good uh, feedback about it because you get to see, yeah, this, you know, Black Muslim authors are the bomb. This is what we're capable of doing. This mm -hmm. is what we've been doing. This is what we've been doing. And we have those different perspectives that, and, and, and methods and, and genres of writing. Like we've been in there, we've been in it. We, we benefit from the African-American literary tradition, okay, which is a big thing. You know, we know how to write in this culture. We know how to make our writing unique, distinctive and in this culture, we know how to do it. And we've been on the forefront of a lot of things like urban fiction, you know, um, romance, yeah. actual romance, <laughs> okay? And not a couple of kids, you know, not the, not, the, uh, not the kid with the parents from another country who's the, the Muslim girl who's in love with the blonde jock. <laughs> <laughs> 
that seems to happen over and over again. There's different perspectives, and it can be raw. Like it's a, like that. She Jackson has a new one out. You know that? The yes, whole- child. He told me. I mean, I had already read it, so I read. You know, he yeah, sent. Okay, you read it. <laughs> That's another thing. Um, yeah, I read it. I was just like, ooh. I, yeah, I read it a year ago. Facebook, you were like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know how he expects me to uh, market that for him. <laughs> That's oh, out of my out. zone. He's got it out there. And you know. He got it out there. But I mean, I, and, and I think that, and there is a place for that. Yeah. There is a place for that. You know, I, I mean, I, I see it as comedy anyway. I, you know, it's very comedic, yeah, it's especially that is a comedic one as well. Um, and I, and I, and he has a lane for that. Yeah. And, and I think that's the beauty of it is that there are Muslims who are looking for that and who are, who, who will see that and who will find it tasteful, who will find it funny. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm proud of him for putting something else out. Yeah. We've been after him for a long time, so I'm I'm glad he did it. There's a need for it. Well, you know the thing is, I'm sure you've heard because your your books do not your novels, okay, are not Pollyanna's. Okay? No, but you deal with some hard hitting issues, domestic violence, uh, drug use, all kinds of things, all kinds of things across the board. I'm sure you've gotten flack for it mm-hmm. from Muslims. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why are you writing that? Yeah. You know, one of the things that I consistently get, because I write very sensual scenes in mm-hmm. my novels, and that's just one of the things that I do. I think that depictions of of sex between Muslims, I think that that's a very important part of romance and how people fall and stay in love. So I just think that it's a really important part of my books. I know you can write romance without them, just for my books, I prefer to have those sensual scenes. Yeah. Them. And so what I always get is, but why are you showing what people are doing in their bedrooms? I'm, and I'm just like, but they're not real people. <laughs> what bedroom? Right. The bedroom's not real? <laughs> yeah. See your imagination. And your mind. I, do you think that when we, we're dealing as an author, when dealing with those hard-hitting topics, okay, and that... Uh, you know, in your books, there there is resolution mm-hmm. to a lot of it. There, there, there's resolution to a lot of it. So do you think that it's important for us to see characters go through those things and come out on the other end? Absolutely. I mean, um, I mean, I grew up in the 90s. And like I said, I'm, um, I'm urban fiction to the day I die. Um, but you cannot talk about the 90s without talking about addiction, Mm -hmm. without talking about uh, the prison industrial complex. You can't can't even talk about people in their 30s and 40s without everybody. It touched every life, even white people, you know? (laughs) It touched their houses too, you know? And and so it's, it's, it's really, and you don't see that you know, being dealt with in the immigrant community, even though we know it also touched them as well. Mm -hmm. A lot of people actually think that, you know, the immigrants, they're all doctors and lawyers and engineers and they're all highbrow tea time. But that really isn't the case because, you know, I'm a public school teacher (laughs) and I see their families, you know, and I know what their children are doing even now. I know what the, you know, the type of, you know, the bullying and the experimentation with drugs and, and sexual encounters that is still prevalent in immigrant community. I know about the girls, you know, who are, you know, thinking about abortion or who had an abortion, yeah. you know, in our communities. And yet, and still, they don't want to talk about it. No. But it happens. Yeah. And so... Mm-hmm. there's that so well, I write for them too <laughs> I write for them too to see themselves well if you turn a blind eye to anything you're going to end up knee deep in it mm-hmm. uh, that's the thing and I think that when we write about these things in a, in, in a fictional set when, when we're storytelling we have an opportunity to address 
a lot of issues without dealing with real people. Right. Okay. And readers get to see the characters go through certain things that are real. Mm -hmm. You know, um, in uh, one book, I have the uh, main female character. She's a second wife, and he's treating her like a hell outside chick. You know? mm -hmm. And that mm -hmm. happens. That's a real mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like, um, do, how do you just, if you are just going to keep turning a blind eye to those types of things, to, to the real fact that, you know, you have, you have people that, you know, will come to the monster drunk, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> or high, or high, you know, um, you'll have people, I remember one, I think he's going to kill me for saying this. But years ago, you know, uh, at, at our old masjid, I won't mention the town that it's in. It's not in the town now that we live in, <laughs> okay? This was all the way back years ago. So anyone who knows us from back then will know exactly what I'm talking about. But it was, when a, it was a teeny tiny community that he helped start. And he walked on two people having sex in the masjid. Mm -hmm. Heard those stories too. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. It's like... Mm -hmm. Uh, and and that, it's a very real thing. Like you said, people are dealing with abortion. You know, people are dealing with a lot of emotions. You know, we want to act like because we keep the boys and girls separate that uh, nothing's going on. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, we, and we're we never supposed to talk to them about the fact that you may be digging this person and what do you do? And right. uh, Slick may come up to you. Slick in a koofy. Yeah. <laughs> come up to you. Like in a koozie. And what do you do? So tell me more about your work in progress. Umi? Umi. 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 Um, so Umi is, is well, let me tell you. Um, I've, I've talked about it a little bit on Twitter about, um, so let, me, let me back up. So e even though I tell everybody that, you know, I, I've, I'm actually signed to a small press and a lot of people will, you know, assume that I'm, um, uh, self-published, um, which I'm not. Um, I am signed to um, Imago Press, and I've been signed to them since uh, 2010. Before that, I was signed to Muslim Writers Publishing, which was started by the late um, Linda Widad Delgado, who was the um, founder of the Islamic Writers Association, which was a fully traditional um, publishing company. Um, and Sister Linda Delgado, Mahimullah Ta'ala, she was a retired police officer who uh, became Muslim. Um, while she was, right before she retired, she was training some Saudi police in Arizona. And they came and stayed in her house. And she was a non-Muslim, but they were there as police and they were training in Arizona. And they stayed with her for eight months and gave her Shahada before they left. Like she became a Muslim. Um, by learning about them. Like, you know, she would see them making wudu and see them praying. And her only job was to give them a room to stay in and bring them to the police um, office every day and then bring them home. But she told me that, you know, just seeing them, you know, like she would offer them, you know, do you want that? You want some alcohol? You're grown men. You don't know we don't drink. Well, you know, you're so far away from home. Nobody's going to see you type of situation, you know? So, alhamdulillah, her story has always stuck with me. Um, I later changed and was with another publishing company, Imago Press, and I've been with them ever since. But, um, you know, since the, the whole boom of Muslim fiction has been out in the world, um, I often get called by some of the major publishing companies as a reader. Um, I get advanced copies of quite a few well-known, now best-selling authors. These authors will drop my names in their books. The publishing companies will ask me to read it and write a review for different, you know, um, different companies and things like that. So I have that. And I have people who, um, in the industry, you know, who respect my work, who reach out to me um, pretty regularly um, to review their work. And that's something I've been doing now behind the scenes for the last like two years now, I would say. Um, 
and it's and it's fun alhamdulillah i mean i i we are we are about supporting the woman I, whoever i can support i want everybody to win like you know uh uh, uh what's the name uh Issa Rae. I, i'm rooting for everybody muslim alhamdulillah when it comes down to it i am rooting for everybody muslim to win i want all my folks to eat i want us all to live well i want all of our stories to get out there i'm not going to block your shine even though sometimes they block ours you know, so I try to be the bigger person. And I know your people want to see you win too. So I'm going to support you because you, we, we are people. We all are people. Um, so one of the sisters said, you know, they're all talking about you. And they all think you're a really good writer. But it's really African-American. And it's really muslim -y. And she said, and I, I don't want you to take that the wrong way because that's what you do. And we love no you. Way you're supposed that. to take it. <laughs> and, I, and, and I'll tell you off camera who said it. But anyway. <laughs> you got to tell me off camera. Yeah, I will yeah. tell you off camera who said it. And she said, you know, they, they're interested in you. But um, think about, like, you can write a story without naming it all the time, without pushing it to the forefront all the time. And she was just like, just dial it back a little bit and see what happens. And so that was, that was almost a year ago. And it really, it kind of hurt a little bit. It hurt. <laughs> right there. It hurt a little bit. The reason why I don't go in that direction mm. of traditional publishing. I'll go indie pub. So like uh, my novellas are right. by indie pub. Right. Working with and that's where I'm, yeah, indie publishing. Uh, because they can be more niche driven. And right. They can, they're more appreciative of diversity. Right. Okay. And they'll give a, they'll, they, 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 they will prioritize uh, diversity and provide diversity to readers over catering to the larger white readership, which is basically mm -hmm. what traditional publishing does. So by those words, it's a little too Muslimy. It's a little too African American. It can never be a little too Muslimy and a little too African American because you're an African American Muslim. Right. And white women are not asked to tone it down, and white men are not asked to tone it down. Okay. That's one thing. That's one of the reasons why it's just like I am totally about Muslim African American Muslims putting their work out there independently. Right. So that they and I support that too. Are doing that work and there are no filters. Don't you dare. There's no filter. Never ever let them put those filters on your phenomenal work. Yeah. I'll be the first one to bash it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Change. That's the thing. It'll, it'll change. Um Duaria, her books, are, your books are very, very specific about the way that you write, what you write about and how you connect with readers, okay? You can go, oh, when someone reads your book. Like, you can make that immediate connection. You can see the culture and everything. The, your prose, okay? The way that you break the rules when you want to type of thing. Going traditional pub will just, I'm telling you, it will kill all of that. That's the first thing. I cannot stand. This was a black woman, a Muslim, a Muslim that said this to you? No. Okay. All right. No. So now, all you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it was a black Muslim in traditional publishing that said it too. Because what happens is. Right. Oh, for sure. Muslim writers, when it comes to. Why do you think that. The, this is the reason why urban fiction became a genre. Right. Because the writers refuse to filter themselves and sell themselves out. Right. I mean, if you look at, 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 just like from the beginning, like at Donald Wayne's, you know, they, people hated that. It was like, no, right. this work out. Because there was, it spoke to a culture, and that's what we need. We want to write to our culture. Right. And we want to write our cultural perspectives. And the moment you talk about a traditional publisher, they have in their head what white people want to see from us. Right the way white people want to see from us the way non-muslims want to see us okay and that's why when you see you know i i can respect people wanting to go through traditional publishing 
but you're going to end up with those same filters. You should never have anyone tell you that your book told from a, your, the cultural perspective that you want to tell it from is to anything. Right. Right. Because when it's to anything, that means you won't make white people happy. Yeah. You make non-Muslim white people happy. That's exactly what it means. That's exactly what it means. Right. And not only that, it, it puts you in your head. You're not able to freely tell the story. Yeah. And for the whole year, I just, I could not write anything. I just, you know, I couldn't do anything because I was just stuck in my head. Like, well, what am I going to write now? You know, I finished the stories for the anthology and that was really all I did last year. Oh. Um, I, I hadn't started on anything. Um, I just started on this story um, a couple of weeks ago. And even during the pandemic, when we first got sent home, I was like, oh, great. I have an opportunity to to sit home and write and I have time and I just, but I, I started and I would type and then it was like, let me, you know, this is not going to work. In your head. They got in your head. You they know, got in my head. <laughs> the, the funny thing is this, and this is the reason why um, a lot of times uh, the people, the, the people that I give my time and energy to are, are independent published Muslims. That's why I prioritize my time and my energy to and I've been approached by Muslims who uh, work with traditional publishers, and I've just told them that my editing roster is full. Like I can't, I can't critique your, I can't critique your novel. I'll review it once it's done, but I can't critique your novel. And there's there, there's a couple of reasons why. First of all, you do not have independent uh, independent indies do not have the same access to certain things that people who mm -hmm. are traditional publishers do, and plus. You, you don't have final say on how you present your work to the world. The publisher no. does. You know, indie pubs, they may or may not be as stringent. You know, it depends. I, 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 took, I took a year looking at independent publishers when I was looking to have my no novellas published so then I could still focus on my novel to have my novellas published because in romance, that's a big thing. They're like, readers want... They yeah. want your next book, your next book, your next book, your next book like that. And so it's just like, yeah, no, this story is like 85,000 words. And I'm trying to tone it down more and more and more. But uh, so I needed someone for my shorter stuff. So I can get my shorter stuff out there while I'm working on my longer stuff. And so I looked at quite a few of them and I just kept on going until I found the one that I liked. Yeah. You know, and so... It's like you don't have final control over your story with a traditional publisher. They know what they want to see, okay? And even now, sometimes, and if you are okay with it, you're okay with it as a writer. But some publishers, it's like, listen, here's our outline. This is what we want you to write. Write it, which is fine, which is fine if you know that that's what is, that is what's going to happen. And, um, and when it comes to that particular book, it's, really not your voice right okay they're your words that's that doesn't necessarily mean that it's your voice yeah so i can't stand don't get mad at me okay <laughs> i can't stand that muslims uh muslim authors are part of the problem of feeding this delusion that you are not a good writer unless a, a, a traditional publisher picks you up. Right. Yes. I've seen a little bit of that divide. I see um, a lot of it. I see and it. yeah, you know, because now you're starting to see so many of them be picked up in the type of stories that they're putting out there. Same stuff. And it's funny because like these are the same people that I saw in the writing groups without a clip, without any clips just five years ago. Like you didn't have a following. You never sold a book on, you know, you didn't, you never went through, you know, you didn't put any work into the ummah. You went straight through the traditional publisher and now boom, you're a success because they bought, you know, a thousand, you know, 10,000 copies, which is what they do. You know, they buy the copies first and then, <laughs> which is cool, you know, because they can distribute it and they have that power. They have the power to send it to the libraries. They have the power to give the discounts to the schools and the different catalogs That's starting to and shift things though. like that. That's hmm? starting to 
Indies are, are starting to make headway in those areas. Well. Right. And that's really all you need. But it's a game that they play too, the traditional it's publisher. They play too. But the thing is, is that uh, it's all the same stuff. Right. And I still say to some of these writers, you know, you're still not reaching the Muslims. No. Well, you are, Muslims don't read. There's that I, until they do. Yeah. That's you know, the assumption. that's the assumption is, is, is that Muslims don't read. Right. I was told so you're, you're selling, you're still not selling to our community. Yeah. I was, you're told, still not writing the stories that they want to hear. Yeah. And so that's a huge problem because it's like, then it goes right on back. It reminds me back to seeing those stories in the library and it's still not a story that represents us. Yeah. You know, and that's the problem. Are you really feeling the need? Are you really feeling the need that is still prevalent in our communities? Because, you know, they're feeling the need because their name is on the, on the cover of the book. On the list. The, liber the librarians love you because, oh my goodness, there's a Muslim girl on this cover. Because you're telling the story that they want you to tell. Exactly. Because you're telling the story that they want you to tell. You know, one of the I was told that Muslims are not interested in romance at all, and that non-Muslims do not are not interested in the pictures of Muslims in romance. At well, all. I was t I was told flat out that Muslims don't read fiction, and that was like 20 years ago when I first started. They're like, mm -mm, Muslim, you know, th that's not going to work. Yeah, you don't, you know. Yeah. Maybe you, you can, you can, you know, finesse them into the background, but they can't be in the forefront. They can't be the protagonist because they're not going to read that. They're not going to support that. And I'm like, but I am a Muslim <laughs> and I do read. And I know, I mean, there's other people like me, male and female yeah. who read. So who, who is this? And I love how they tell you about your community. It's like, that's bold. Well, you know, I, I didn't see you at the masjid. <laughs> You know, and, but that's the thing. It's like, it's all, it, it, if you want to go the traditional publishing route, you're going to end up a lot of times, uh, we haven't, we don't have a tone, a, a, a kind of like a Toni Morrison type of model yet. Yet. She'll come. <laughs> she'll come and she'll be a black Muslim. But yeah, she'll come. And um, so it's like right now, diversity is a thing. Muslims are a hot thing and publications and everything like that, especially when it comes to YA and uh, uh, fantasy and stuff like that. Okay. And so you write those books and, and, and you, and you go to a, a, a agent and you get picked up by an agent, you go to a traditional publisher and you sell all those books and everything like that. And, and that's great. I'm not, that's not what I'm not hating on that. I'm not hating on that. It's just that, that I've decided that that's not the route that I'm going to go in. Okay. I've, I've had people recommend agents to me. Oh, why don't you put in a query to this agent or that agent? And I'm just like, no, I'm listen, I've been an acquisitions editor and I do not want my work validated by somebody's arbitrary finite parameters of what good fiction is. Okay. Because when you look at what are considered classics, okay, uh, um, Gustave Flaubert, Jack Kerouac, uh, um, uh, Margaret Mitchell, Gone with the Wind, one of the best-selling books, uh, Harry Dietrich Stowe, yeah. okay, and Uncle Tom's Cabin, which is correct, literally. What it did socially, fine. But as a piece of literature, it's not executed well at all. Right. You know? And so my whole thing is that white men, specifically, their, their, their ability to get into those gates with a lot of mediocrity uh, is just substantial. So I'm not going to have, I, I'm not going to have an agent tell me whether or not my book is good. I'm not going to have a publisher tell me whether or not my book is good. Bring it to the readers. Some will like it. Some won't like it. You know what I mean? So right. it's just, And you build a readership and you build a following that way. So that's the way I decided. Now, the problem that I have, and this is what I'm hating on, 
Okay, and that's the reason why none of the NBA books and author speaks authors are traditional public. Traditional public. This is the thing that I'm hating on. When you try to act like you as an author, that you are more credible as an author, because some white person decided that your work is good. It's like Melissa uh, Harris Perry said. She said, the only reason why I have a television show is some white man decided that I, he wanted a black woman to have a television show and that I was that black woman. Right. You know, type of thing. We're building a canon here. Right. A literary canon. American Muslim literary canon. There needs to be an expanse and a breadth of work. And the only thing that traditional publishing does is stifle that, first of all. And mm. the only thing that uh, authors, traditionally published authors with their snobbery, do is try to make it seem like their work is the only work that is credible and right. that should be read. And that's just simply not the case. And besides, traditional publication is, 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 is a dying horse. It is. It I, is. I got too much. I mean, I, I'll be honest. I'm still, I'm still hoping that, you know, I find a place that is worth being there, yeah. you know, um, on my terms. Yep. And if that happens, right, on my terms. If it happens, alhamdulillah, if it doesn't, then we keep moving. And I still have, you know, the, the demographics that I'm, I'm, I'm pushing and writing for. And that is the legacy that I want, you know, to leave behind is that you find your tribe, you find the people, like you said, who want to read your stories and you write for them. But really, you know, centering it on yourself. We write the stories that we want to read. Exactly. I've seen this meme going around like, oh, I'm so tired of all of these, you know, black writers writing about, you know, the hood girl or the boy who goes to jail or the somebody who does drugs. Why can't, and it was about a young gay, why can't, most, you know, black teens just have a, a good time and be, feel good and no type of trauma? And I said, if you want that story, write it. Right. There's nothing wrong with that. But know and understand that that boy who went to jail, there are boys who need to read that story too. Absolutely. And it's not wrong. Absolutely. Like there are girls who need to read about abuse because they've been abused and they need to feel that validation. They need to feel that worth. Absolutely. And on the page, they need to see themselves. If you want to write about the little boy flying in on a dragon, like a treyu, you know, um, write that story and that'll be beautiful too. But you, you know, a canon is just that. It has all types of genres, all types of narrative. We all can eat. Can we all eat? Can we all share? We all and share. that's what I really think with the traditional authors and the indie authors and the self publishers is that we are all representing something that needs to be there for a reason. And we all, and it's, it's, it's not just for ourselves, but it starts with ourselves. Mm -hmm. It starts with our inner stories that we're sharing. So, um, you know, so that's where I am with my work in progress. Yeah. Um, I, I was definitely 20 years ago, I was definitely self-conscious about even calling it urban Muslim fiction. You know, is that appropriate? Is it not appropriate? What will other urban um, fiction authors think? about me coming in and doing my own thing in the genre, but really I've gotten so much love, you know, like some very, what I call the OGs, you know, the original gangsters of the, you know, from Wahida Clark, you know, reaching out to me, Omar Tyree, you know, I've gotten nods from serious heavy hitters um, about what I do. And I don't even, Talk about all of that, you know, on the other side. Nothing is more original than uh, uh, Black Muslim writers. They're yeah. Right. <laughs> but they're also original. And, and, and here in the United States, I mean, African-American Muslim writers, a very specific uh, form of writing, okay? Mm -hmm. Because of the layers of the amalgamation of Islam, American literary culture, and African-American literary tradition that 
produces a very specific type of writing, you know, uh, and also produces what well, we've been on the forefront of a lot of things. Okay. Um, we're definitely on the forefront of, of self publishing. Yeah. Comes to Muslims and our, our work getting traction. Okay. I mean, you look at Amina Muhammad Diggins and her, her book getting adapted into a play. Mm -hmm. as well as Halima de la Vera, you know? So it's like, and when it came to, when I was doing my thesis, I did my thesis on romance and I had to, I had to whittle it down, whittle it down because of the simple fact that when you think of Muslim romance, when you're researching Muslim romance, you're coming up with black Muslims. That's the main right. one, especially adult fiction. So if you're talking about adult romance fiction, okay, that's what you're gonna that 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 centers uh, uh muslims that's what you're gonna see you're gonna see black muslims mm -hmm. you know and right. so uh that's what happens you know when you're looking for that work especially in literary criticism because there's so much out there and, it, and you get you hone it down you get more and more specific and there's a lot of great stuff out there like i said we write across a breadth yeah we write across the breadth and some of some of it is friendlier to uh, it aligns more with what traditional publishers won't want and some don't and every author has to make the decision well do i still want my work out there the way that it is or am i ready to make adjustments to my work okay because the level of adjustment is very very different you do not have the social capital of say a stephen king or yeah. the romance of uh, Nora roberts who just died i shouldn't have mentioned the name i can't think of it so you just don't have the the so you don't have the same social ca capital in the in the literary world of traditional publishing, right? And that's the beauty of self publishing and indie pub indie pub is that it levels all of that out, right? It levels all of that out, and your money is yours. That that's the beautiful <laughs> thing. That's the beautiful thing. And your money is yours. When I first saw the royalties that I got from the first month of uh, my first book, My Way to You, which is still selling, mm -hmm. okay? It's constantly selling, all right? Every day on KU, someone's reading it. Mm. Since December 2018, when it was released, every day someone has been reading that book. There have been page reads every single day for that book. And so when I saw that, I was like, oh, yeah, it was definitely worth the money that I put out because I made it back triple fold the first month, mm. you know? So uh, it definitely uh, encouraged me that I, I went down the path that I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. I definitely see why if you want to use a publisher, you can utilize a publisher, but I like what you said, okay? According to what I want. Right. Based on what I want, based on my work, you right. know? Because you could be, like, someone like you, publishers are lucky to have a writer like you. Honestly, because I've been on the other side of that. I've had to tell uh, the publisher, uh, yeah, this is not, this is not even a book. This is not a draft. This is not even a draft of mm -hmm. a book. You know, I've had to tell them, well, you know, uh, I'll talk to the author. And, you know, uh, you know that your main character is actually not the main character in the book. Mm-hmm you know and then they publish it anyway yeah <laughs> it's not right. my business but it's just like i've had so really good writers really good authors are hard to find mm. they're very very hard to find across the board self-publishing indie press traditional publishing they're very very right hard. right and finding your the right fit is is important and rejection you know when you're talking about the traditional publishers the big ones it's it's rampant you know jk Rowland received hundreds she said of rejections um terry mcmillan said she received rejection yeah. um so it's it's common and it doesn't mean that you're not worthy or that you're if you do if you stand your ground and you do not want to alter your work you'll probably find a publisher sooner or later that'll appreciate it some of it right is brought, it gets it gets on the right desk or right. Gets on the right computer screen 
And so it's like, yes, we want you and that type of thing. There's good and bad in all of it. But yeah. I really think there's a conversation around, well, I'm a traditionally published author. Now, all that means is that someone is paying you uh, 40 or 60% of what you could be earning yourself. That's true. Hey, but for me, it's the distribution, you know, being in the schools and the, that's the exactly. only thing. If we could find a way to get the distribution, Definitely to that. get into all of the libraries, I call libraries all the time and I tell people, you can request books that you want from your local library. That's the best way to uh, promote small authors, traditional authors, yeah. indie authors, self-published authors, call your libraries and request it. Yeah, I do that all the time. And you can even tell schools, you know, you should have this book in your school library. There are readers that do it for my books, too. Not in the school library. Right, right. Well, colleges, I'm sure they have, the, you know, library. students who are doing some creative well, writing. You want to know the big issue? Okay, is that I deal with some real issues in my book. And, you know, more and more, uh, colleges are selecting works that are less triggering. Mm. You know? They're selecting work that's, that, that's less triggering. Yeah. Um, and in my first book, uh, something happens to the woman that's very, very traumatic. Right. And so I have to put trigger warning. And that turns a lot of I just saw that. And I, th I would thought that was an interesting conversation. A lady, there was a meme, also another meme on Twitter that books should come with trigger warning symbols. Yeah. I mean, All books. And most books don't have them. Yeah. A romance, you have to have them. Almost all so, of a lot of romances they put that trigger warning in. Okay. Uh, the 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 genre is becoming very unfriendly to uh, certain types of trauma, you know, which I don't think is very fair. But that's the way that it's rolling. And that's the other thing. I mean, when you're when you look at a genre like mine, okay, uh, romance, uh, it is very much it very much catered to the sensibilities of white men. Of course, everything does. Extremely. <laughs> and um, I don't think sci-fi fantasy is a little tiny bit, but nah, it's like single, no, no, no. No. I think that's that right there is an elitist group of writers by itself. Fantasy? Science fiction, fantasy, that's very elite. Mm. So of course it has a very clearly white lens. Yeah. that is being filled romance has an extremely white lens and even when uh uh you have like there was an author i'm not going to name the author whose work i love 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 and uh she is a self-published author and then she went with with one book and that's the that's the other beautiful thing like you can do both there are plenty of romance writers like courtney milan who started off self-published and she has a, uh, a traditional publisher and she still self-publishes her stuff too. Like, yeah. yeah. And so uh, I, I love her work. Not, not, this is not the author I'm talking about, Courtney Milan. I'm not talking about Courtney Milan. <laughs> All right, because she just tore down a whole organization that was like racist towards her. Mm. And we were all in the, the like, nah, you got to, you going somewhere with that. But I'm not talking about you, Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh another author and so i love I, I still love her work and uh but i could tell the difference between the book she got traditionally published and the self when she self-published mm. and after because mm -hmm. she does both now right so you can always kind of tell there's a little bit more of the way she, the, the the writing that she uh did early on and the perspectives and everything like that that she did early on, it's not, as, and it's not like the publisher totally filtered her down and stripped her, but mm -hmm. you can really tell the difference. Yeah. Between, you can tell the difference between the two. So romance, because it's now white women, it's now white yeah. women. Uh, I've had- It's always been a big, big uh, oh, genre. Feminists hate me. <laughs> oh no. Oh yeah, they hate oh, me. Oh no. <laughs> they hate me because I write alpha males, mm. and when I write um, when I write male characters, my main male characters, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim, I 
look at the way the Prophet Muhammad was. Okay? Very confident man. All right. That who was a leader. Right. Protected his family, protected his women, you know, and laid down the law when he had to lay down the law. You know, type of thing. So it's like, oh yeah, oh that's toxic masculinity. Mm. <laughs> Hmm. We like, need another hour to talk about that. Well, the, the the majority of my readers, they love my male characters. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. Oh yeah. I can always tell it was a review from a feminist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all the time. So it's just like, what are you going to do? So do I filter all of that out? Okay. No. I, I, I do I filter out the vulnerabilities that I give my black female characters? Because in a lot of romance, not all romance, but in a lot of romance, it, it still continues to be the black female character is kind of a prop for the male character's uh, uh, sensuality and mm. his, his masculinity. So mm -hmm. she's kind of like a prop and she's got to be perfect. You know, right. That magical negress type of thing. She can't, mm. she can't uh, uh, be vulnerable. You know, she can't be mad. Or right. Anything like that. And so, you know, I, I've gotten pushback because that's not something that's common in the genre, okay? And so now, as authors are doing that more and more, it's just like you may get pushback from some readers. So what do you do, you know? Um, because that's what a, a traditional publisher is going to look at. Yeah. Okay? When it comes to this, you know, your female character is not going to sell. Mm. She's not the typical black female character. She's, she's always angry. She's bratty she like that like she's not gonna sell you know yeah. type of thing so what do you do you have to kind of decide what it is that you want to do but i think we'll, we'll we'll work it out eventually or not whether or not we work it out black muslim writers are still gonna write yeah <laughs> and that's that's the end that's the oh, that's the goal that's the goal and that that is what we're pushing for you know like you said at the beginning to we're creating a black muslim reads canon you know, something that we can have and expand on. Um, and that's really important. That's a really important goal. And, and we have to stay committed to that. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm very excited about that book. Uh, and thank you everyone for watching. Uh, if you like uh, what you've heard and seen, then please hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. Pick up your copy of NBA Muslim Black Muslim Reads. Pick up a copy of Tried and Tested, okay? You will thank yourself for it, okay? And look out for the next NBA Muslim author to speak. Assalamu alaikum. Words lose society.